And uh, I have my Bible here if I, if I need to look at it for a few moments, but for the most part, I'm going to be narrating these events in my own words and giving you the references to the biblical passages so that you could refer to them at your own convenience. The first individual that we're interested in is named Michal. Uh, sometimes you'll hear it pronounced Michael. Uh, Michal makes it a little easy to remember that this is a woman's name and not the man's name, Michael, which also occurs in the Hebrew Bible. Michal is both daughter of King Saul and wife of David, first wife of David, I should say. Uh, she's first introduced to us as uh, David makes his introduction into the court of King Saul. And uh, what we're told is that, and it's a very poignant reference, uh, we find it in, uh, here we are, very poignant reference, we find it in 1 Samuel chapter 18, where it says that Michal loved David, and two lines later it says, and David was pleased to be the king's son-in-law. So we have an amazing contrast here between the reason for the relationship between David and Michael from Michal's perspective, she loved him, and from David's perspective, he sees her as a means by which he can advance himself. David becomes increasingly popular within the royal court of Saul, so much so that Saul becomes paranoid and tries to kill him. Michal risks her own life and reputation and standing with her father, the king, by enabling David to escape. David flees south to his own homeland, away from the forces of Saul, and completely forgets about and ignores Michal, doesn't send for her, doesn't send her messages, and uh, ultimately marries two other women down there. Michal divorces David, uh, we're not really clear of the mechanism for that, but I imagine a powerful woman like Michal could simply declare herself no longer married. Uh, perhaps her father had to do it for her, and, and she remarries another man. We never hear from her again until after her father Saul and her brothers are all killed in battle with the Philistines. David rises to power in the south and becomes king of Judah, and he sends for Michal whom he had deserted some, and I just got to throw out a number here, ten years before, we'll say. The number is not clear from the chronology in, in 2 Samuel. Uh, anyway, 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel. Anyway, he sends for Michal, who has been married to another man for some amount of years, and he asks one of Saul's former military officials, give me my wife, Michal, whom I purchased with 200 Philistine foreskins. David paid a bride price demanded by Saul, killing 200 Philistines, cutting off their foreskins, and presenting them to Saul to pay for this woman. And now, after years of deserting her and misusing her, he says, give me my wife whom I purchased with... Not give me my wife whom I love... Not give me my wife whom I need and have pined away for these many years. Give me my wife that I've purchased. And Michal is forced to return to David and his harem to abandon her beloved husband, it appears, and join a harem in which she's joined, she's linked to a man that she has grown to hate. And the last time we hear from Queen Michal, she observes David at the absolute pinnacle of his power, uh, returning in festal procession to his palace after bringing the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. And she, and this I do want to read, it's found in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 6, uh, verse 20 on page 393 in the NRSV. David returned to bless his household, but Michal, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, how the king of Israel honored himself today. 
uncovering himself today before the eyes of his servants' maids as any vulgar fellow might shamelessly uncover himself. David, in religious ecstasy, dancing before the Ark of the Covenant, uh, exposed his lower body as I imagine the... Uh, the priestly uh, garment that he was wearing rose up in his spinning and dancing. Uh, so she accuses himself, she accuses David of exposing himself. She accuses David of being a boorish, low-class, low-rent, trailer-trash kind of a person. She's a queen. She grew up in the royal house of Saul. David grew up as a, as a lowly shepherd. David responds in kind. It was before Yahweh who chose me in place of your father, dig, dig, and all his household. Now remember, her father and her brothers have all been killed not too long ago to appoint me as prince over Israel and the people of Yahweh. And the argument proceeds, and it's the last line I want you to consider. Verse 23, And Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no child to the day of her death. I want to suggest three possible explanations for this occurrence in Michal's life. Keep in mind how important it is in this ancient society for women to have children. First possibility, that Yahweh is punishing Michal for her failure to support David's dynasty by as they say in the Bible, closing her womb. Second possibility, David is so disgusted with Michal and he no longer needs her that he refuses to sleep with her and lets her die in the harem an ignored, bitter, lonely woman. Third possibility, which I find most intriguing, Michal refused to sleep with David. She, after all, was a queen. And she realized, according to this reconstruction, that David needed her more than she needed him. For David to have an heir born from Queen Michal, he would have an heir that was both his son and King Saul's grandson. There were many within the kingdom who accused David of uh, dealing wrongly with Saul, of, of, of deceiving him and betraying him and overthrowing him. And David desperately wanted to get out from under that accusation. How better to do it than to have an heir who was Saul's grandson? Everybody's happy. She refuses to sleep with David. Another, pos another woman within uh, David's horizon, and she's probably my favorite, although she only occurs in one chapter, and we will be going over that chapter in class. Uh, I just want to touch on it briefly. Abigail is one of the women that David marries while he is uh, in exile down in the south avoiding King Saul. Uh, and, and the marriage happens like this. I'll just summarize it briefly, but I do want you to read it. It's found in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 25. David is functioning as sort of a... Uh, he's running a protection racket in southern Judah. He says that he and the troops that he's gathered around him will protect the wealthy landowners and herdsmen who uh, release their flock and grow their crops in southern Judah. He'll protect them from invaders and, 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 and uh, raiders. And yeah, indeed, there, there are raiders who come up f through these borderline regions. But if they refuse his protection, which comes at a price, they've got to feed his army and their families and his families. If they refuse to do that, then David himself will destroy them. It's kind of like uh, uh, these racketeers who go into stores in neighborhoods and they say, uh, you give us uh, you know, $150 a week and we'll make sure that nobody breaks your windows. And the guy says, uh, what do you mean? Nobody's ever broken my windows before. And the racketeer says, well, if you don't pay it, we'll break your windows. It's kind of the same deal, the same kind of operation. So David goes up to this individual whose name in the Bible is Nabal. And uh, probably the, the most accurate translation of Nabal uh, would be uh, uh, 
jerk, idiot, or asshole. I mean, that's what the word means. It's, it's, it's played for laughs. I mean, obviously nobody would name their kid that. Uh, anyway, Nabal refuses. And David is on his way marching with his troops to kill everybody in Nabal's household and uh, take, take the property that uh, was not freely given to him. Nabal's wife, Abigail, hears of it, quickly assembles the caravan of offerings, uh, dresses up in her best outfit, and rushes out to meet David and intercept him before he could come and kill her husband and her as well. Uh, she speaks to him very eloquently. She plays on his vanity and she persuades David to turn aside and accept her offering. As soon as Nabal hears about it the next day, he dies of a heart attack. He just says he keels over dead, presumably the shock of the prospect and how close he came to being killed. At that point, David immediately sends for her and uh, she becomes his second wife. We never hear from Abigail again, and I really regret that. Did she just fall into obscurity when she's brought to Jerusalem and is forced to uh, uh, share her husband with so many other responsibilities and so many other women in his harem? Uh, did she die early in childbirth? I think that's probably most likely. Uh, but what would David's life have been like had Abigail stuck around? The only woman, it seems to me, that was ever able to match him and be his equal. Anyway, she vanishes, but she's my favorite. The third one you should be familiar with from Theology 101, and that is Bathsheba of uh, the David and Bathsheba story fame, where David is looking out of his palace and he sees her bathing and he falls, uh, he falls for her and sends for her and they sleep together and then he sends her back to her home and she's pregnant. She sends word to him that she's pregnant and David tries every possible way to get uh, uh, his, her husband to take responsibility for the child. Her husband refuses and he has her husband killed and immediately marries her. And the big question among others about Bathsheba is uh, was Bathsheba complicitous with David in their affair, that is, was she using uh, her own uh, feminine wiles to advance herself? She was married to one of David's military officers, but it's a lot more advantageous to be married to the king. So was she uh, kind of bathing herself and displaying herself uh, so as to win the heart of the king, or is she rather a victim, somebody who was uh, inadvertently spied upon and had no power or authority to say no to the king. And we'll leave that for later discussion. And finally, before we leave David, we have the figure of Tamar. Yes, this is the same name, the same Tamar, uh, the same name Tamar that we have from uh, Genesis 38, but this is a different figure with the same name. She is David's daughter. And the story of Tamar goes as follows. Uh, her half-brother, who not coincidentally is in chief competition with her full brother, and I bet he start using these names so we don't get all confused. Her full brother is Absalom. That is, they share the same father, David, and they share the same mother. Uh, an otherwise obscure woman that we don't know anything else about. The half-brother is Amnon. So Amnon has the same father as Absalom and Tamar, that is David, but has a different mother. Amnon and Absalom are the oldest and second oldest in David's family, respectively. And so there is some significant competition between these two very ambitious young men. Add on to that that Amnon falls madly in love with his half-sister Tamar, uh, which is, appears to be an acceptable family relationship in that society. That is, at least among the royal family uh, and, and elsewhere, it's acceptable to marry 
one's half-sister. He falls madly in love with her and he uses a, a deception, a subterfuge, to get her alone with him in his house and then he rapes her. She begs him not to do it. She pleads with him to just ask her father for permission to give her in marriage and this wouldn't have to happen. She rapes him and as soon as he, fi he rapes her and as soon as he finishes, in a, a very realistic fashion, psychologically it seems to me, David, uh, excuse me, uh, Amnon feels disgusted with her and casts her out of his house. In which case, she has no recourse but to run to her brother and her full brother Absalom and stay as a, uh, a shamed and spoiled woman in Absalom's house. Although some years later Absalom has Amnon murdered, we never hear from Tamar again. These are the key women in the story of David.